So today we're going to be talking about a material that is ubiquitous in your life. It's called silicon. Now, to begin with, we have to ask ourselves, what in the world is silicon? Silicon is a group four element. It falls right underneath carbon in the periodic table. All right. And so um, you're probably very familiar with it. You've heard of things like the Silicon Valley and we're living in the silicon age. And so what is this material and why do we use it so much? So first off, let's take a look at the properties. So what are some of the properties of silicon? Well, this is a piece of silicon, all right? It's basically sand, silicon dioxide, without the oxygen. So it just becomes SI. Now, this is a very, very pure material, and we're going to see why that's important in, in a few minutes. But the most important thing you can see from this stuff is, is that it's very shiny. It's very reflective. It's very brittle, all right? Very hard material. And, uh, and it has a very high melting point. You wouldn't know that from looking at it. But, um, and what's unusual about it is it has a band gap, and we'll talk about what a band gap is in a, middle, a minute. But anyway, so these are some of the properties of silicon. So why do we care about silicon so much? All right, well, the reason we care about silicon is because if you make it very, very pure, all right, so let's think about purity for a second. I'm talking about making it nine or 10 nines pure. So that means I'm making it 99, 0.9999999% silicon, all right? That means I have nothing in there. I have less than one part per billion of an impurity. If I do that, this material is a very good insulator. It does not conduct electricity at all. So you would think, all right, great. So I have an insulator. I have glass. I have lots of insulators out there. Why would I care about silicon? Well, it turns out that what's weird about this material is that then if I add a small amount of an impurity like boron or arsenic, all right, boron is a group three element and arsenic is a group five element. When I add that, you can actually increase the conductivity of the material, all right, the conductivity 10 trillion times with less than 1% of an impurity. So that's a stunning property of a semiconductor, right? So let's think about why that works. All right, to understand why that works, the first thing you have to do is you have to understand that this material has, because it's a group four element, it's going to wind up having four covalent bonds. So it's going to basically bond tetrahedrally to its neighbors, all right? And then when you put a, something like an, uh, other silicons around it, they all bond tetrahedrally to all their silicons. And so every free electron is tied up into a bond. And that's why this material is so insulating. Now then, if I add an impurity like arsenic, into the material and it goes onto the substitutional site so it sits where the silicon is, then it's going to form its four bonds, okay? But arsenic has five electrons, so it has an extra one left over, right? And so that's the challenge. If you have that extra electron left over, it can suddenly conduct. And that's how you take something that is an insulator and you turn it into something that is a conductor, all right? So, why is it useful? Why is this a useful property? Well, first you have to go back and look at computers. What computers were when they first started, the first computer was probably the ENIAC computer. It's composed of 18,000 vacuum tubes and weighed 30,000 tons. So huge, huge machine. And um, if you think about it, the way it worked was, it was basically a, a collection of switches, all right? And these switches, enabled us to do manipulations of both letters and numbers. And so the ENIAC computer could do 300 calculations per second. But the key was is that you needed to have a switch. Why is the switch important? Because you can represent numbers either in base 10 like we do, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or you can re represent them in base 2 or binary, such as 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, etc. And so if you represent them in binary, then that means that each one could be a switch that's on and a zero could be a switch that's off. So the key is to be able to make switches. Now then, how do semiconductors work as a switch? Well, they really didn't work very well until in 1947, the group at Bell Labs, John Bardeen and Britain uh, uh, and Shockley developed an understanding of how to make a point contact transistor. So they used germanium and it was the first transistor that was a solid state transistor. And that basically meant that we could now have a solid state switch. 
So let's think about how that works. In order to work as a switch, you have to understand a little bit about how silicon can be made into a transistor. All right, so the key to making silicon into a transistor is that a transistor is a three tunnel device. All right, you're going to take silicon like this and you're going to add an impurity to that silicon and that impurity is going to wind up being something like arsenic or boron. And if you do that in one region and another region, you'll actually create two contacts. So you'll actually create a, a region that's metallic here and another region that's metallic there. If in the middle I put some oxide on the surface and then I put another metal, then when I try to pass electricity from one side to the other side through these two metal metallicized regions where the doping is, right, the current won't flow. However, if I apply a bias to this third contact, I can actually pull electrons up to the surface and create a conducting pathway. And when I do that, suddenly current flows from one side to the other. So in, in effect, if I'm applying a bias, I can turn it on. And if I take off the bias, I can turn it off. And so I have a switch that I can turn on and off. And that's how a transistor works. All right. So early on, they used germanium. However, they quickly discovered that silicon was not only less expensive, but silicon formed a fabulous dielectric, SiO2, silicon dioxide, on the surface. And that left you with a much better transistor. And so quickly, silicon replaced germanium in the 50s. All right. So now you know what a, a, a transistor is. The transistor can also act as an amplifier, by the way. So if I modulate the voltage on that middle contact, what we call the gate, a little bit, then I'll get a big amplification on the drain side, that third contact. And so that's how your transistor radio worked, is it would pick up a very weak radio signal and it would amplify it. And so you suddenly had, you could hear the music you were trying to find on the radio station. Okay, so now we know how a transistor works. What is the brief history of all this? Well, so in the 50s, we were making discrete transistors for things like radios. Um, and then towards the end of the 50s, a man named Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments and Bob Robert Noyce at Fairchild came up with the idea of integrating these onto a single wafer. So the idea was is that if I took the problem they were getting is, is that if they had two transistors and they wanted to connect them together, they had to put a wire between them. And that wire was delaying the speed at which those two could communicate. So they thought, well, maybe I could put them onto the same piece of silicon. And so Kilby had the idea of putting a bunch of different discrete devices on the same silicon piece. And Noyce had the clever idea of actually doing that, but also adding metal lines on there to connect all the pieces together. And so ultimately they awarded him the, the patent, but they settled their differences. And in 2000, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for discovery of the microelectronic device. So in 1968, Noyce and another na guy named Gordon Moore left Fairchild to start a new company. And that company became Intel, it was Intel. And so Intel, of course, is ubiquitous today as one of the leading manufacturers of microelectronic devices. One of the things that Gordon Moore noticed in 1965 was that, that there were 10 devices on a chip. And by 1969, it had grown to 1,000 devices on a single chip. So what was amazing was that we have been doubling the number of devices on these chips every two years since 1965. All right, now, there were some inter interesting predictions that were made at that time. Ken Olson, president of DEX, famously said in 1977 that there's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. So people did not always see where this was leading to. Um, but what you can see down here is, is that we started to figure out how to grow these, these bools of silicon, all right, and to process the silicon wafer. And it's been evolving ever since then. So let's talk about how you actually process silicon. To begin with, you have to take sand and you have to convert it to silicon. Now, metallic grade silicon, as that is called, is a, a tremendous business. 90% of all the silicon that is made today goes into the metals industry. It's actually used for alloying aluminum and iron. So if only a fraction of all the silicon that is reduced from sand actually goes into electronic grade silicon. The next step is, is that you have to actually purify that silicon 
And that requires you to first turn the silicon into silicon tetrachloride, a solution that you distill. And that gets it pretty pure. And then you do a bunch of zone refining, which is a way of basically sweeping out the impurities using a melt to further refine the material. Once you've got it very pure, you're going to put it into a, a crucible and you're going to melt it. And then you're going to stick a single crystal seed into that and pull it out very slowly while you're turning it. And that will grow a bool, a very long cylinder of the silicon out of the melt. Now you're going to take that cylinder, lay it down and slice it. And that's why you have wafers. Now, what you can see here is that when we first started growing these things, the wafers were very small. This is because the bulls were very small and this is what we actually processed. So as time has gone on, we've gone from one inch to two inch to four inch to six inch to eight inch. We're all the way up to 12 inch wafers now. So this is the size of the, uh, of the wafer that is used currently in the microelectronics industry. All right. There is talk of about going to 450 millimeter wafers, which would be 16 inch, but probably won't happen until 2022 or later. Now, once I have this wafer, I have to turn around and figure out how I'm going to make a chip out of this, right? I'm going to make a whole bunch of transistors on this thing. The way you do that is that you're actually going to start by cleaning the wafer. Everything has to be very, very clean. This is why it has to be done in a clean room. And then you're going to spin on a photoresist. A photoresist is a thin plastic layer that goes over the surface that's photosensitive. And then I will put it into a system in which I can expose that photoresist and open holes in that photoresist. That allows me to do things like etch or add impurities through ion implantation or other processing steps where I'm going to actually go about making the transistor. Then what I'll do is I'll wipe off that photoresist or I'll burn it off, ash it off, and then I'll do another layer and another layer. And you keep doing this over and over and eventually you're going to get your transistor built. Then you have to connect all the transistors. So you're going to start laying down all these layers of metal, eight, nine layers of metal on top of it. Each one separated by a dielectric. So it takes about a month and a half to actually process that. At the end of that month and a half, however, what you'll have is a wafer that looks something like this. All right. This is a wafer from Intel that's been processed. And each one of those four squares represents one of your Pentium processors. So this is effectively 350 laptop computers, right? Now these have to be chopped up and then put into a packaging, hermetically sealed into a package, so that they can then function in your computer. So this will be shipped off to Singapore, diced up, put into packaging, sent back, and then Apple or whomever you're buying your computer will then stick those, these chips into your computer. All right, so now then, as I mentioned, Moore's Law has been in effect for since 1965. And so right now we're up to, in this particular generation of devices, we're currently at 2 billion transistors in these four squares. In another year, we'll be at Eight, at 4 billion transistors, two years after that will be to 8 billion transistors, so it continues to double. But this takes a tremendous amount of effort because if you think about it, the size of these transistors is getting smaller and smaller, the packing is getting tighter and tighter, right? And the power requirements is going up and up. And so this becomes a very, very challenging problem to stay on Moore's Law, all right? And so this requires billions and billions of dollars in investment. Now, what's fascinating about this is that if you actually look at the calculations that you can do per dollar, this has also been growing enormously in this graph you can see. And so you can, you can tell right now that we're getting closer and closer in terms of calculations to that of the power of the brain eventually, maybe. And so, um, so we've got a long ways to go. We've got some really, really important challenges. You're going to see this in your other video because one of the challenges that we're running into is that as these devices get smaller and smaller, the amount of power it takes to run them, because you're running all of them, they start to leak a little bit more, they require more power, and so the electricity requirements go up. So we're constantly trying to drive that electricity requirement down, so we're making lower and lower power devices. And so we have to come up with ways in which we can make these, and we may ultimately have to switch materials away from silicon to possibly something else. Materials they're considering are things like molydisulfide, which is a two-dimensional material, that maintains its mobility, the ease of the electron flow, even when you get it down to very, very small sizes, only a few layers, of atom layers thick. So this is the challenge. Now, when you think about it, what is the social impact of silicon, all right? So you can sit down and try to think of all the things that you could have that wouldn't exist without 
silicon. So all of your cell phones, your computers, your, your calculators, your watches, your everything requires silicon, right? Even my Fitbit requires silicon. So it's become very ubiquitous in your life and it will continue to be a, a, a challenge going forward. And so as a society, we have to figure out not only what are we gonna do with it today, but how are we gonna use it in the future? Especially when we start to invent things like flexible electronics, all right? And so then it's gonna become more and more a part of your life. It has some negative connotations as well. So for example, there's been a tremendous increase in myopia in your eyes because of the fact that everybody is staring at very small screens. And so there are some potential downsides to this. There's also some social considerations. And so you'll hear more about those when you do your exercise and you consider the idea that, that maybe we have more and more friends today because we have access to all this technology, but we have fewer and fewer close friends. So it's an interesting thought. So I don't know where the future is gonna go. I do know that the, the electronics industry is probably gonna stay on Moore's Law for a while. We're gonna to continue to pack more and more transistors in there. We're gonna find alternative materials to possibly use when we have to. And it's gonna be continue to be a part of our lives. And I think the challenge is gonna to be to figure out how we use this and how we make the best integration of this into our lives in the future.